Hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the opening plenary. I'm delighted to welcome you all. I'm uh, going to assume you've all had your coffees because we're really going to get into it in this session. We're talking about putting gender into technology in order to accelerate a better future. I don't know about you, but I could really use a better future right now. Um, before we get started and before I introduce the amazing panelists we have here today, I want to remind you that uh, we would love to hear from you on social media. So if you want to use the hashtag WFGM18 or the hashtag Bridging Humanities, we'll try to give some poses that will be really good on Instagram. So we would love to hear your comments and your opinions. And to be ready, make sure you're kind of warmed up because at any point in time I might look at you, this lovely crowd of people, and ask you to raise your hand to show your opinion about a topic so that we can get a sense of how the room is reacting. So I'm going to get right into it because I can't wait to hear what our panelists have to say. This subject is, is a really complex one because we're talking about whether or not technology is going to help the gender divide. Is it, is it going to decrease the gender divide or is it actually making things a little bit worse? Is it going to be a dystopian future? Is it going to be a utopian future? And our panelists today are going to talk about this subject from a lot of different perspectives. They're going to talk about it from a policy perspective, what should governments do? From an organizational perspective, what should leaders do? And also we're going to talk about what we as citizens should be doing in order to make sure that we're actively participating and making sure that we're building the future that we all want. So before I introduce the panelists, I just want a quick show of hands. Who here thinks that we're heading towards a utopia? <laughs> oh, the optimists. So happy that you're joining us. Who here thinks we're going to towards a dystopia? Raise your hands. There's, wait, there's not enough hands. Dystopia. Yay? OK. All right. Those of you who are thinking about it, so just keep that in mind. We'll see if we can maybe change your mind. I'd like to introduce the panelists. We've got with us uh, uh, Florence Verzelen, yes. the Executive Vice President of Industry Solutions, Marketing, Global Affairs, and Communications. That is a lot of Dassault Systems. We also um, have with us Trisha Hobson, Global Chair of Norton Rose Fulbright. We have uh, Laura Lotrello, the Vice President of Data Center Group Services at Lenovo 9. And we have Monsieur Jean Todd, the President of the, Federation, of the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile and Secretary General uh, Special Envoy for Road Safety at the UN, who very bravely decided to join our all-women panel today. So I'm very excited for you to join us. OK. I want to start by asking all of you a very quick question to sort of set the context for this huge topic. And the question is, we talk so much about technology, its impact on the future, its impact on the world that we live in, but in your opinions, what is one major blind spot that, we don't, that you don't think is getting enough attention when we talk about these issues? What's something that we need to put on our radars as we start to examine the pros and the cons. So Florence, I'm going to start with you. Uh, yes, according to me, if we want to go towards Utopia, what we need to do with technology is to turn technicians into engineers, and this is not enough discussed. Technicians into engineers. Okay, we're going to ask you to elaborate on that in a second. Trisha. I hate to be the lawyer, but I am the lawyer on the panel. So <laughs> what I will say is that I think that um, not fully understanding um, the ramifications of uh, deploying AI and technology within an organisation, the ethical and other uh, complex legal issues around it, I think that there's a lack of understanding at the moment about the potential ramifications that are really far-reaching for companies. So we're, we're looking too much at the, f the cool features and less about some of the the ethical stuff. There's a lot around uh, efficiencies and productivity um, and how it can be used in those ways, uh, but you know the potential for discrimination and the potential for um, difficult ethical issues and the legal complications from that, I think, need to be focused on more. Okay. Laura? The digital world today is already amplifying the stereotypes in the real world for women. You see fembots, you see feminine virtual assistants, and those stereotypes then, the reality, mimics the digital world. Mm. So we have a dangerous feedback loop starting. Okay, Jean. 
So I'm going to take uh, something which is obvious and which complicate life of every citizen in cities around the world, which is congestion, traffic. Traffic, okay, I'm very intrigued. We're gonna come back to you about that. All right, Trisha, I want to start with you because your experience um, dealing with some of the legal ramifications of the ethics that you talked about, there must be a lot of interesting questions that we're grappling with um, on a legal level. So your work sees you exploring the legal ramifications of some of these complex ethical issues. The technology that we're creating doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's linked to our society, it's linked to our history. So what's your take on how these technologies are evolving and are there differences that you're seeing between how men and women are developing new technologies. Okay, so I'll start first with the, the issue around men and women and technologies and use a, a current example that we're working through within our firm. So um, legal partnerships are traditionally quite, you know, very conservative um, structures um, built by men for men over a very long period of time. Oh, oh, little, hold on one sec. I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm just going to ask you to pause one second, Trisha. And actually, we're going to welcome our, our final panelist. So delighted you can join us. We have Gabriela Ramos, who's Chief of Staff and Sherpa to the G20 from the OECD, who ran over here at the speed of light to make sure that she could join us today. So welcome. Um, we will get to you in just one second. So Trisha, sorry, once no more. So so yes, so very, so very, very uh, male and traditional. And and so um, introducing sort of technology in the way that it has been over particularly the last sort of five years in particular has seen a really rapid um, disruption to most industries and, and, and also to ours. And so looking at carefully at how sort of men and women are approaching this issue, um, recently we've been going through a, 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 a sort of a program at the firm and it's thrown up some very interesting um, results and so we introduced an innovation award and it's a call out to our entire global network um, to anybody really to come up with an innovative idea really based on technology um, to look at solutions for us and our clients and what was interesting about it and we're working through the judging at the moment but what we found is and we're seeing a pattern is that the male entrants um, and products tended to very much focus on sort of um, the system that exists and really enhancing it and, um, and building on it from an efficiency and productivity point of view. Whereas the female entrants, and it's a little bit of a generalization, but there is a trend, tended to look for ways to work around the system and to alter it. Um, and that was very telling in terms of the way that men and women looking at um, technology solutions for our business. And there was one in particular which was really interesting because it was by an all-female team and cross-border team, which was unusual. And it looked at a platform for assisting employees uh, in relation to um, ways of dealing with mental health, with um, social issues, with crisis, with whistleblowing and looking ways for them to use technology to not have to report into the system as it exists, but finding solutions and, and help in other ways. So what that really said to me was that um, you look at that and you think to yourself, well, in terms of how we're going to implement our AI and our technology in our business, we have to be so cognizant of the different approach of men and women to it. And we've got to make sure that the people who are making the decisions, and from a governance point of view, there is equal representation and absolute gender equality uh, in terms of the decisions that we're making now because of the implications it will have uh, in the future. So, I, and, and I think if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, it, you, you raise an interesting point about bias, that sometimes the bias that somebody brings to the technology is, is just their own worldview. It's not a bad bias or it's not a malicious bias. It's just they see systems that exist and they want to, you know, they just want to build upon those systems. And I think that's a, actually a huge blind spot for many of us to think about, which is what are the technologies, when we're using new technologies, what were the belief systems or the worldviews that they were, they were built on? Because it's, you know, if, if, you're, if you're content with the current power dynamics, you're going to create technology that keeps strengthening the power dynamics. That reflects it. And that reflects it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. 
Gabriella, you, uh, the OECD has recently conducted a huge study looking into um, the impacts of the digital divide and the digital gender divide. I was wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about what those findings were and um, how governments can prevent technology from replicating some of these exclusions. Thank you, and, and, and sorry to be uh, late, but the panel moved upwards, and I had another <laughs> commitment, so. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Rahal. I think that, uh, um, let me just uh, take you a step back in terms of the digital revolution. And I like the title of this forum because it's about inclusiveness. If you take a look at just the digital transformation as such, independently of gender lens or not gender lens, it's a winner-take-all kind of dynamics. You have huge uh, companies, the frontier firms, that have the technology, that have the skills, that have the access to finance, that are very well capitalized, and you have lagger firms. And this is producing this gap that we're seeing in, in, in the world that is just contributing to the increased inequalities that we know are, are pre prevalent in our, in, our, in our societies. Why? Because the digital transformation is very demanding of high skills, is very demanding of very uh, a, a structured uh, and managerial and organizational skills that you need to be really be uh, able to put in to take advantage of it. Now, uh, when we started in the G20 uh, with the Argentinian presidency, the Australian Sherpa told me, why don't we take a look at the gender issues on the digital revolution? And we're talking only about technology takers. We're not even talking about technology shapers or how do we contribute to, to drive the technological transformation because it seems that it comes from the sky and then you take it and you try to drive on it. And the, and the results uh, were um, really worrisome. On the one hand, it's true that if things go well, you will have the possibility of use technology for a more flexible kind of organizational arrangements that will probably benefit women. That's a fact. What we're seeing with the platform economy is that it's not the case, that the quality jobs are lower, that the protection is lower, that the risks are passed into the worker because he's the one that needs to insure himself for health and for pensions and for all of the things that we used to have in the analog world. But let me tell you that in terms, there, there are gaps for women in all of the aspects. Access. We have 320 million women less connected to mobile telephony in the world. We have uh, only 8% of the innovations are being led by women. The rest is by men. Uh, women receive, and I salute Kiara, uh, women receive uh, much less funding in terms of uh, these uh, startups. Uh, but there is something that I want to bring to your attention because one thing is to say, okay, this is just a reproduction of the analog world. We know that women receive less financing. We know that the, is, uh, is more difficult to scale up their, their businesses. We know that there is uh, more difficult for them to have networks and because of the kind of obstacles that we have in the analog world, which is the, the, the burden sharing on, on family duties and all of the things that you know in terms of uh, inequalities. But one aspect that is really worrisome is how the technology is being developed. And you were talking about that. Because the fact is that 90% of the downloads of softwares that we have registered, 90% is done by male all teams. Therefore, the technology, the software, the gadgets, the instruments are developed by male teams. And if you look at the sector, we also know, and I have to say, we have many business people here, and Jen, I know you have been a champion on these issues. The business sector is four times lagging behind than the pro uh, pro uh, public sector and any other sector, and the tech technology is worst, because the only 5% of women are at the top of managerial uh, force 500 industry. In the technology world, is 3%. You go to Silicon Valley, sorry. It's a male world. And, and that's why some people say that probably that's why we have a lot of software war, uh, related to war games and probably would have some other kind of uh, in, inputs into that. And then the question of the artificial intelligence. You are the owner of data. This is a winner-take-all kind of approach. You do the different uh, experimentations for the next developments that are going to be put in the market. And you are just translating the same biases. 
And we have examples for uh, Amazon launch a, a, a using of the data that they have to just to, to figure out with an algorithm. An algorithm is just a, a figure that you embed in terms of putting variables to get some outcome in the process. They wanted to know what are the elements for successful people that get the job. And then they just track and develop the algorithm. Suddenly, you only had men and male profiles. How do you tackle those? If we are unable to tackle the stereotypes in our world, how would you do when you don't know how the algorithm was built? This is really, so, so let's, it, I'm, I'm not pessimistic because I think we have the data, we have the figures, we know how to tackle it, but the fact is that uh, really this is another angle that we need to be very, very conscious and very active. So what I, what I loved about what you said is that even though we're on a panel sort of talking about technology, it seems that a lot of the major roadblocks to building this better future are the offline aspects of our lives. It's how we're running companies. It's how we're supporting women and getting education. It's how we are making sure that uh, the companies have inclusive policies and governments are creating inclusive uh, ecosystems. And so I, I really think that's an interesting point because sometimes we focus so much on the features and on the tech and how cool it is and how shiny the app is that we tend to forget that the technology is just a reflection of the world that we live in. So we have to be as adamant about closing equality in the real world, the gaps of equality in the real world, as we are in developing new technologies. And I'll come back to you about what, what uh, governments can do specifically um, in a sec. But uh, Jean, I wanted to talk to you about this real world, um, real world attempts to close the gaps, uh, close some of this gender divide. You work a lot in a male-dominated industry, automobile industry. You work a lot uh, with world governments around conditions of road safety. So I know that you've done a lot to help make conditions a bit more inclusive for women. And I was wondering if you could share with us uh, some of the things you've done, not just in your own organization, but also in terms of you know, industries that we might not see a lot of women participation, like motorsports, for example. So, I mean, I will divide your question in, in two parts. I mean, first, uh, technology above everything. And uh, clearly, there is a revolution around technology in the uh, motoring uh, industry. And uh, I mean, it happened at two levels. What is happening in developed countries, like in France, like in US, and what is happening in developing countries, or what is not happening in developing countries. So that's the first thing. And I mean, just to, I mean, to pose a problem, we have uh, every year 1.4 million people are dying on the roads worldwide. And uh, about uh, between 30 to 50 million people are injured because of road traffic. And I must say about 70% um, of, of those figures are concerning men against about 30% concerning women. Mm. So what does it mean? Probably women are not driving as much as men, number one. And number two, women are more diligent, are more cautious than men. Hold on, you know, hold on. You're, so you're, you're saying, hold on, you're seeing the data that you're seeing is showing that women are better drivers. <laughs> I just want to, I just, I just want to make sure that the data is supporting us because we have long fought against the stereotype. So please, okay, just really want to make sure, very excited about the science. So I'm, I'm happy to endorse that. <laughs> All right, I don't have guys. Any problem. I will say a normal, <laughs> normal use of a car, they are better because they are more diligent. Uh, on racing, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not yet happening. We are working on that. We are working. We want more women in motorsport. You know, we would like a, a woman to compete in Formula One. We, we would like a woman to compete and to be competitive in Formula E. So we are, we are hardly working on that. I know that, I mean, we at the FIA level, we have a woman uh, commission, and uh, the chairman or the chairwoman of this uh, commission uh, is a well-known uh, former rally driver, which is uh, Michelle Mouton. And in fact, uh, when she was competing in rallying, she was probably one of the few women being able to compete at the same level than men. Is that that we want to achieve? Okay. Uh, if I go back to, to technology, 
I mean, it's absolutely fascinating the evolution in terms of technology which has occurred over the last decade. Not only on car, on motorbike, on bicycle, on electric bicycle, on hybrid technology, on electric uh, technology, but uh, also at the level of road infrastructures, um, at the level of uh, post-crash post care. You know, something is absolutely essential. For example, when there is a crash, I mean, the time between the rescue of the victim to arrive to the hospital is absolutely essential. So on that, technology is of a great support. And you know, now on the all modern car, it's something which is going to be compulsory in all European uh, community from uh, next uh, January. Mm -hmm. There is a crash immediately, it will be emergency call. And you will be able to be rescued. So that's why, I mean, we have seen sensational improvement uh, around the uh, road, uh, road traffic, about, uh, around the victims in developed countries. If you take an example like France, in 1972 you had 18,000 people who were dying every year on the roads. 45 years after, five times less, with three times more vehicles. Unfortunately, I was mentioning about the global figure. In developing countries, it's not happening. Why? Because there is not this kind of technology. Fortunately, I mean, it's kind of cheap and very good technology, mobile phone. You know, almost every citizen now has access to a mobile phone and can enjoy the service of a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when it's getting more complicated, more sophisticated, more expensive, then, I mean, it's only elite part of the world who have access to those technologies. So we need, we need, we need to improve that. You know, and we are working, but I mean, we need the commitment from everybody. You know, not only from the government, not only from NGO, but we need to have responsible manufacturers, responsible suppliers, you know, who do accept that. You know, I will give you an example of technology. The car you will buy in Paris, and I, want, I will not quote a specific brand, but the car you will buy in Paris will be different than the car, it will look the same, but will be different than the car you will buy in Mexico. Why? or a car you will buy in Africa. So we need to compete to have equal access to the, to the cars. And so that's, a, I mean, that's a absolutely a fascinating challenge, but technology and responsibility will participate to that. So it, it seems um, like all of these complex issues, when we hear people talking about them, the answer always seems to be, well, more education, more women in STEM, more STEM. And I want to ask uh, the panelists in just a very quick sort of one sentence, a rapid fire question, and then we'll get into the details of it. But do you think that getting more women into STEM is the answer? It's part of the answer. Part of the answer. I agree, part of the answer. Keeping women in STEM is a big part of the answer. Keeping women. I would say keeping, bringing women to ICT disciplines, which is even beyond STEM. I can only share, you know, I have only 16% 16% of the votes. <laughs> just okay. Maybe wait one yeah, go ahead. I was thinking back, so I've got a STEM background, so I've got a degree in physics and maths, and when I was doing my law degree and my science degree, in law, 45% women. In my physics degree, I was one of two women out of 40. Um, so the statistic is so low, but it hasn't actually moved that far since. Uh, in the audience, we're gonna do this practice round again. Just raise your hand if you have a STEM degree. Raise your hand if you thought about going into a STEM field and then for whatever reason decided not to. Interesting, okay. So Florence, I want to shift it to you now because you talk a lot about how education and the evolving job markets and how one of the challenges we're dealing with isn't just the technology, but it's just that we can't educate people fast enough because everything is changing. So I wanted to know in your experience, um, how do you think jobs are gonna evolve and how will education systems have to adapt? Can they adapt? Yes, thank you for the question and for tools who have thought of being in STEM and not going to STEM or ICT, I want first to, take you, to tell you something, it's not too late, you can still do it. And why? Why? Because the world of, the world of jobs, the, world, the jobs market is evolving. In 2022, 
42% of the people who are working are going to have two employers, at least. 65% of the kids who are entering primary schools today are going to do jobs when they leave schools that do not exist today. So we have two issues, leveraging different way of working and creating on the way the new jobs of tomorrow. And there is a lot of room for all the women in that room and everywhere in the world for these new jobs, this new world of tomorrow. But what is really, really important, if we want to create that new world, but if we also want to make sure that women have equal opportunity in this new world, is to really design, participate to the design of the jobs of tomorrow. And here, all of us who are in companies today have really a duty, a really a duty to think of the job of the future. What are the jobs going to be in five years from now? And how are we building the workforce? to get there. There is a lot of studies to get there, but it's very important that we create the thought leadership around that to create it for tomorrow for all of us. And second, the other very important thing is that if there is going to be a lot of jobs created, new kind of jobs, we have to make sure that we empower the people and the women to be in a position to thrill, to deliver, to to realize everything they want to realize in these new jobs. And for that, it's not about original training. It's not about having made a STEM or an ICT training when you were 20 or 22. It's about learning by doing. It's about learning to learn all along your job, to create, to be present in these new jobs. Nobody will have been trained, but you can participate to training programs when you're in another job to participate in this ICT world of tomorrow. And last but not least, another thing which I think is very important if we want women to take more part in the ICT world of tomorrow, it's what I just said at the beginning. 42% of the workers will have at least two employers in 2022. Uh, what does that mean? It means there's going to be more and more virtual teams women working abroad on specific projects, not even meeting each other, uh, men and women, virtual teams working on a car, and we already see that a lot, companies working with value networks of people. And for that, we are going to leverage more and more marketplace platform where people will be able to collaborate on projects. And when you're working in the virtual world, nobody really cares about whether you're a man or a woman, Everybody cares about what you're able to deliver. And at the end of the day, it's kind of the end of some BS when you're working in this virtual world. And I'm very optimistic of the, in the future because of that as well. Thank you. So, Laura, you also have a STEM degree. Um, I wondered if you can elaborate a little bit more on the answer to the question about, you know, why do you, what do you believe drives women maybe either towards or what you were saying about from leaving STEM um, and maybe talk a little bit about what Lenovo is doing to engage both women and also women from the next generation. I've, I've spoken to a lot of women who've chosen STEM careers, who have left STEM careers, or chosen STEM fields and then left STEM fields. and there is one common thread throughout all of them. First, they had encouragement and exposure at a very early age. Women that choose STEM and stick with STEM, they start when they're six or seven years old in an interest in STEM, which to me was very telling because a lot of times we're tackling this issue at a much later point in life, but they really are making those decisions early. The second is most of them had some form of encouragement from their family members or a teacher or someone in their life that showed and supported their talent. Some of them did not. One of my favorite stories is of a woman that she has 26 cousins, 25 plus herself, and it's half and half, 13 men, 13 women. She is the only one out of all 13 that made it into a career and has children and is in STEM. The other 11, 11 of them, 
they chose to stay at home because that's what the family meant to do. And then one of them works, but she's not a mother. So one of 13 was able to make it into a career and stick with that career. And what, what was really sort of sad about the story is every time she goes home and visits her grandmother, not her grandfather, but her grandmother, she asks, so when are you quitting? When are you quitting that job? And there's so many places in the world where women are seen as your role is to raise children. That is your primary role. And you are not supposed to be pursuing a career, and particularly a career in a man's world. And that's what we see STEM as. One of the things that um, Lenovo is doing that, that I sort of started locally on our campus is I had the opportunity to go into a high school. And we, many of us did. And it was sort of an ask me anything career day. So get up, ask questions. And I learned so much from those kids that day. One, they were very educated. They had talent. They were able to code. They had networking certifications. They designed web pages. They had talent that we could use in the workplace. The second is they all were hungry for internships. They were willing to work for them. But what they were getting was filing papers in their mom's office. They weren't getting real work. So that day I went back to my team and said, we have, we're, we're hiring 10 interns. You guys, you have to give me a win-win proposal. It has to be helpful for Lenovo. It has to be helpful for the student. But you can hire up to 10. That year we got six. The following year we opened it up to the campus. We have 28. Last year we hired 65 high school interns on our campus in Lenovo. And it exposes these kids to what it's like to work in a corporate environment at a very early age. And we have to remind ourselves that we're making these kids make decisions about their careers at that age. So why not give them the opportunity so that they can help see what they want to be? I think it's um, so encouraging to hear organizations take stances like this, and I think you prove the point that when you have diversity in leadership, then those diverse experience lead to the creation of other opportunities that can benefit other people. I will, I do kind of want to introduce something new though to, to see what you guys think of this, which is we've been talking a lot about STEM and technology and coding and ICT, but I wonder if part of the imbalance that we're seeing in our society with the way technology is being used is because we don't have enough infusion of non-technical and non-technological roles in the conversation about technology. Like where are the artists and the sociologists and the psychologists and the, um, you know, like where are the, the, the creatives in all of this and why are they not shaping this conversation to create more like empathetic tech? Gabriella, I wonder what have you seen in terms of like why are we not championing the arts the same way that we're championing, or why are we not championing the arts as an extension of technology prosperity? I think that's a, that's a wonderful question because it brings me back to what I was exactly thinking by hearing the, the panelists. We always think, let's go STEM, let's go uh, uh, ICT, let's go coding, let's go, yes. Those are skills that you need to navigate the current technological wave, not to shape it. The shaping the technological wave requires some other thinking that considers the human being in its entirety which is spiritual, is mental, and, and how about trying to uh, enact uh, human dignity in technology, ethics in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, trust in the systems, and therefore it is beyond uh, getting the technical skills. I completely agree with you. Let me tell you that when we were uh, discussing the question of, of, of how the, the education systems can cope with this, and it's exactly not to just provide the kids to navigate the current way. What happens is that you need to, um, in a world of, of massive information, the less that children need is just to receive information or just to have the tools to, to, uh, to um, address the issues of today. What they need is self-confidence, they need social-emotional skills, uh, they need empathy, they need critical thinking, they need how to discriminate the information that is provided to them. 
So all these things are really enables of a, of a, of a more comprehensive of human development that we need to that we need to advance, and the, and the whole point is also to try to um, uh, turn around this this conversation in the sense that we are always thinking how technology is going to help us. What I feel is that how are we going to be turning technology to serve the building up of the different society, different humankind. We're full of protectionists. We're full of patriotism, we're full of, uh, of, of uh, uh, populism. Uh, I, I've been talking to leaders uh, in, the, in the context of the G20, and they cannot even uh, pronounce migration. They cannot talk about migrants. Nobody can defend the rights of migrants. It's going to cause them to fall, as it had happened to many. So this kind of, let's go back to the Renaissance man, or the Renaissance woman which was more comprehensive, which was more uh, empathetic, which was more uh, believer that we can use technology to build a, a much better world and, and to enact arts, culture, to bring back all of those, those years that had been uh, underrepresented in this highly technological world. Um, other panelists, would you give... Oh, great, thank you. Florence, you have comments. Thank you, thank you, Raph. And no offense, but... I think you have an old-fashioned vision of the ICT world. Dassault System is a world leader in innovation software. And let me tell you, we don't have only data scientists or software engineers. We have a lot of other profiles already today. I don't know if she's in that room, but we have Anna Sancio, which is a world-leading designer working for us on the design. We have teachers, professors working in our company as well. Why? Why? Because we think that we are building software to create a sustainable world. Our purpose is to create universe, virtual universe, that are going to harmonize product, nature, and life. So what Gabriella was talking, very rightly, I really think this is happening now, and this is the world we are creating today in ICT. This being said, we have Anna, we have some other very wonderful women in our company, and there is at least five of them in this room. Hello, girls. Um, but we still, I mean, we will welcome more women. And I really think not, it's not so much about lacking opportunities for women in our company, because really we do everything we, do, we can to attract them. It's really about role modeling. The reason why there will be more women in ICT, more women in this kind of sector, be it data, in data scientists and in design, like Anne, it's when they will see that it's possible to do careers in this sector, and more than possible to do careers in this sector. It's fun to have careers in this sector. I didn't choose ICT because ICT is a growing field. I choose ICT and I choose DASO system because I'm having a lot of fun every day. And the message we have to convey to all the women is that choose a fun career, come with us. That's it. So, but, but hang on, I think, but I think you're actually proving my point because you're saying you are hiring outside of the normal technical skill sets. You're also hiring designers and you're hiring teachers and you're hiring people who in other organizations might be excluded from ICT roles. Yes, because they're bringing a lot to ICT and they're bringing a lot to our companies. But we're, we're hiring these people, men and women. Yeah. We're trying to prove that there can be a great career in ICT as well. Our chief architect at Dassault System, which is really the person who is building all the architecture of all our software, she's a wonderful woman. So we really want to show that this is possible, and again, it's a lot of fun. So, and I think that's a really great point. I would love to hear more leaders in organizations talk about how they're bringing in, we're talking about diverse perspectives, talking about how we're gonna bring, I mean, I love teachers and, and designers and also like artists and creatives. There's user experience designs, there's sociologists. I think there's so many interesting perspectives that can be added far outside just technical specifications. Um, how do you feel, how have the students responded uh, to some of the internships opportunities? What are some of the stories that you've heard? Many of the students are just grateful for having the opportunity to interview. I mean, just a simple ability to come in and understand a corporate environment and be able to get a chance, they, they appreciate it and they, they love that. 
But what I heard from most of them is it either solidified their decisions and what they wanted to do in their careers, or it completely went the opposite direction and they understood some new paths and new ways to go. So every single time we've done this, and it's literally just a six week program, we are changing the lives of the students that walk through that door and hopefully for a better outcome in the future. So we're nearing uh, the end of our time and I wanted to ask our panelists because I think it's important while we talk and debate these issues to think of some concrete things that we can all do, either something to think about or an action that we can take uh, in order to bring some of these lessons into our real lives. So Jean, I wanted to start with you. What is one thing that the audience can do or should think about in order to maybe make better decisions as they navigate this new era? You know, you have, um, first I think you need to educate about technology because, um, I mean, you have so much access with uh, technology, but uh, in fact, you take a mobile phone, you take a computer, what do you use out of it with the potential of the whole uh, machine? Then I feel um, the use has to be controlled because, um, I mean, uh, too much technology can mean uh, isolation. Mm. You take uh, young people. I mean, young people, they communicate much less because they are in contact with their own world, and it can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you take even uh, all of us. I mean, all of us, I mean, it's uh, much less communication amongst uh, human beings in social life or during office works. So that's something for me which has to be very well monitored. Then, um, I mean, you take a new <laughs> automotive industry. I mean, you have access to so much technology. Unfortunately, there is not enough communication about what you have on your car. And I will give you an example where it's a, it's a driver help you know, which is ESC, Electronic Stability Control. Now, in European community, it's something which is compulsory. And it's absolutely sensational, because, uh, I mean, it makes the car about 30% safer than a normal car without ESC. It's kind of revolution like EBS, anti-braking system. And um, unfortunately, I mean, people, have this technology on their car and they don't know they have it available. So I think we should inform, we should communicate much more about what you have available. What is the access which is already existing? And then if we, if we come back to, I mean, your first questions, identify one thing, and I was mentioning uh, congestions, I was mentioning uh, traffic. You know, it's not something we should accept. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm sure everybody this morning said, okay, we need to leave uh, earlier because we will have traffic. And everybody had traffic, you know? And in fact, I'm sure that here in this community, I mean, we're all privileged people. But we so, must but, but hang on, I don't want to get off track onto traffic. So if you had one thing you were saying that they should look out, I mean, there's a lot of things, don't get me wrong, but if there's one thing you can, pe people should do, which if I'm hearing your point correctly, it was to um, look outside of the bubbles that we're all in and maybe try to look for sources of information from people that are a little, a little bit different from you so we're not so, so isolated. Would that, be, would that be a fair... One thing we should do for what? Yeah, like that. If you were going to say for one, the one thing that they should do, since we we are running, we're running out of time. I want to give them one thing that they can do to think, to better think about these technology issues. I mean, I will say be, be disciplined. Discipline. You know, be disciplined. I mean, simply people are not disciplined. That's why you have so much damage uh, on the roads. Okay. So being disciplined, and uh, I mean. Um, Follow, follow, follow the rules, so be, be well educated, be and, and do that around you as well. So be disciplined and continue to be great drivers, ladies, and show them how it's done, okay? Um, so, Gabriella, one, one thing. One thing, be aware, and do not reproduce the stereotype, the biases of the analog world in the technological world, because this is exactly what we're doing. Be aware of the downsides of the technology, in terms of cyberbullying, in terms of the production of violence that we're producing, fake news, echo chambers, etc., 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 
but more than anything, we're just translating our biases into the technological world. Let's just be very conscious and try to control that. Great. <laughs> Laura. Two things, briefly. <laughs> One, Lenovo is publishing a Lenovo, uh, our diversity and inclusion report today. So we are making a stand to show where we are, and we're not balanced, but we will get there. Join us and publish your organization's diversity and inclusion. Secondly, as individuals get involved, you are mentors, you are inspiration for our future. Get involved and show that you can mentor the students that are coming up. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Trisha. My point would be use your voice. Um, if you are particularly women in senior leadership positions, um, which unfortunately are still too few, um, this is such an important issue. What we do with technology right now is going to shape the future of the workforce for all of the young women coming after us. So if you have a voice, you have a responsibility to use it, and that's what I would urge everybody in this room that has a voice to do. Excellent. Thank you. Florence. Um, my advice will really be think of the jobs of the future that are going to be created in your industry and be as inclusive as possible when you empower new kind of people to join these jobs. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. My one thing would be to think of one young woman in your life that could use an encouraging hand, an opportunity, a connection, something, and reach out to them by the end of the day and try to help them see what they need. Let's help the next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists.